somewhere deep in the Ozark woods, there's a few people who everyone tries to avoid the most. If you're not careful, they may find you before you find them. <laughs> okay, guys, we're back. We're recording again. Uh, found another. Let me just go over here so I can reel this down. Found another one from Jabzy. Jabzy. Oh, yeah, I'm subscribed. I had subscribed to them earlier. Uh, they did the one. I did a well, review of their video on uh, the horse manure overrunning the cities in the 1800s. Uh, but anyway, this is the last slave owners in the U.S. Native American slavery. Five civilized tribes tra trail of tears. So let's go and see what he has to say about Native Americans and slavery. Slavery, of course, came to an end in the United States after the Civil War, but weirdly not everywhere, at least not right away anyway. Whereas most slaves were freed when the 13th Amendment was passed, some slaves had to wait one more year until they achieved their freedom, as they were enslaved by the Native American tribes, specifically the so-called five civilized tribes of Cherokee, Choctaw, Chickasaw Creek and Seminole. Now Native American ownership of slaves of African descent does muddy the waters of some historical narratives, but it should not be forgotten. Some argue that they adopted the practice, obviously from white settlers, in an attempt to appear more civilized in the eyes of the US government and to prevent further expansion. But when you think of the Trail of Tears and the forced removal of Indians from their native lands, you probably don't think about them moving with hundreds of black slaves. Or if you imagine a chief of the Choctaw, you probably don't instantly think of Greenwood LaFleur, who had a plantation in Mississippi with 400 slaves. Plus, when you think of the Cherokee, you probably don't think of them putting down a huge slave rebellion in 1842. So the idea of slavery within the Native American tribes being somehow easier is also a bit of a myth, as when runaway slaves tried to make their way to Mexico, they were often being pursued by the Cherokee or other tribes. However, to begin with, there were actually people who kept slaves for a lot longer than even the Native Americans of the southern US. These are the natives of Alaska, which was only purchased in 1867, and they held slaves for another 20 years or so. For instance, in 1886, a Tlingit man named Sakwa escaped from his owner. He arrived at Sitka and asked for legal protection from his Tlingit owners, and in the following court case it was said, a custom or right prevailing among the uncivilized tribes of Indians in Alaska, whereby slaves are bought, sold, and held in servitude against their free will, and subjected to ill treatment at the pleasure of the owner, is contrary to the 13th Amendment to the Constitution of the United States. The life of the slave is entirely at the disposal of his master or his mistress, and it has been customary among them to kill one or more slaves on the death of a master or on the happening of some other event, such as the completion of a new house, boring the ears or putting out an eye of a slave or some other mode of marking the flesh has been and is now a custom with some of the families of these people. The evidence shows that the object of such mutilation is to impress upon the slaves their inferiority and render their humiliation complete. Now this practice wasn't exactly new, as the Russians, when they invaded Alaska, commented on the use of slaves in their battles against the Tlingit in the early 19th century. Then of course, under Russian rule, serfdom was introduced and slavery was expanded upon. But of course, this wasn't the same form of slavery as experienced by many in the continental United States. And just before I get there, I do want to highlight a further slave trade in South America, just because I find it particularly interesting. As the Americans were fighting their civil war, the Peruvians struck out across the Pacific and began to capture the residents on Easter Island during their slave raids. 1,500 men were either killed or enslaved, or half of the island's small population. And this had a profound impact on the inhabitants. The loss of people in the preceding decades, along with these slave raids, helped develop a new cult, the Birdman cult, which eclipsed the old religions that were potentially the basis of the famous giant heads. As part of this cult, they would select their own leader, by making them swim shark-infested waters to collect an egg, and the first to return would be named Birdman of the Year. However, this did little to stop the population's decline, and there would be very few people living there, when other Europeans came exploring a couple decades later, and began shipping heads back to places like the British Museum. Anyway, back to the United States. Of course, slavery there was just part of life for many Native Americans, as with anywhere else in the world. In fact, you may well have heard of one of these slaves, Sacagawea, who was enslaved as a young girl 
by a group of Hidatsa. She would then be sold to a trapper from Quebec, and later she would help Lewis and Clark in the expedition out west. Many tribes, like the Iroquois, would help return runaway slaves in the 18th century, and every tribe had a different approach to slaves and their contact with Europeans. So it's pretty hard to give a guide to an overall stance of slavery, as every tribe was different. But come to the 19th century, the tribes in the southeast, the so-called five civilized tribes, began to become more like European settlers in the United States. There are many reasons behind this. Notably, they now had many mixed-race people in their tribe, and often leading them. Greenwood Lafleur, for instance, was one of these mixed-race people. His maternal grandfather was Push Mataha, while his father was a French trapper. So, whereas many full-blooded Choctaw, Cherokee, may have opted for a life further from the American borders and hoped to maintain their way of life, many of these mixed-race people were happier to adopt American customs, including slavery. Out of the tribes was the Cherokee who held the largest number, and at the beginning of the 19th century, they held around 600 black slaves in their lands, while by the outbreak of the US Civil War, they had 4,000 slaves. This may seem low, but the total population of Cherokee was just around 21,000. Therefore, 10% of Cherokee people held slaves. Compare this to the white people in the slave states of the southern US. There, nearly 400,000 people were listed as slave owners on the eve of war, out of a population of 12.25 million. So, this meant that just over 3% of people were slave owners. But again, the larger slave owners among the Native Americans were mixed-race Cherokee, like Joseph Fan. And under their influence, the Cherokee leadership even began to arrange their laws based on race, as in their constitution of 1827, they banned anyone of African descent from voting on tribal matters and even becoming a Cherokee citizen. As many began to realize that removal from their land was inevitable, they were more keen to assimilate with the United States, negotiate better lands, and essentially... I feel at home, and the people that work here are responsible for that. They ...become equal to the Americans in the eyes of the government. So when they embarked on the Trail of Tears, hundreds of black slaves were brought with them and were forced to work on newly built plantations in the southern US. Therefore, some of the Cherokee elite began to merge with the white slave-owning elites in the southern states, as both of them began to persecute black people. Many Cherokee slave owners did free their slaves after the Emancipation Proclamation, but they would have to wait a long time before they were recognized as Cherokee citizens, as the descendants of slaves held by the Cherokee were still demanding their rights in 2017. And back to Joseph Van. It was in 1842 that 20 of his slaves escaped and began raiding arm stores in Oklahoma. Their goal was to escape to Mexico, which had outlawed slavery in 1836, and to free as many people as they could en route. Fifteen other people were freed, but they were quickly pursued by Creek and Cherokee, who killed over a dozen runaways. On the way, the slaves even encountered a couple slave catchers, one of which was a white man, but the other was a Lenape tribesman. They were bringing back a runaway slave family, but they were killed and the family was freed. The Cherokee then raised a militia of a hundred people to pursue the runaways, and they caught up with them near Red River, where, tired and exhausted, they were promptly caught and returned. Some were executed for the killings of the slave catchers, while many other runaways were put to work on steamboats working on the Mississippi. Although unsuccessful, this encouraged many other slaves in Cherokee land to try and escape, and the number of attempts ranged in the hundreds. As for Joseph Van, he died when a steamboat exploded in 1844, but his old plantation in Georgia, which he occupied before the Trail of Tears, still stands today. The Chickasaw followed a very similar path. Once hunting became harder due to decreasing animal populations, they took to owning slaves to work on land. This occurred at least as early as the 1790s, and the American government hoped it would settle them and sort of teach them about land ownership and assimilate peacefully. The Choctaw, like the Cherokee, also banned people of African descent from becoming citizens of the tribe, even if they were mixed race. In 1840, they expelled any free black people from their land, and any who remained risked being enslaved for life. But don't believe that this was a view held by everyone in the tribe. Some Choctaw, like Cherokee or other Native Americans, despised slavery and even housed runaway slaves. The Creek again followed a similar path after the Trail of Tears, and some believed that the work that the enslaved black people did was the work of women in their society, and therefore this made them inferior. Thus, this justified enslaving them in their new home.
Plus, they even began raiding Seminole land looking for further slaves. And this was because the Seminole were far more inclined to allow runaway slaves to settle in their land and assimilate. This large population of black Seminole, however, proved to be a tempting target for white and Creek slavers. So, although the Seminole did have slaves, they didn't base their society on race, and any freeman, whether black or native, was a free man. But as the 19th century progressed, many began to adopt the Creek and white model of chattel slavery, which forced many black Seminoles to escape to Mexico in order to escape a life in slavery. So, when the Confederate States broke away from the Union, up to 10% of Native Americans, albeit mixed-race Native Americans, held slaves. As such, and given their location, many of them joined the southern states. The Choctaw created a number of... Now see, that's interesting. We have 3% of southerners, the whites, well, non-native non southerners, 3% had slaves in 1861, but they said 10% of uh, Native Americans owned slaves. That's interesting. Also know that one of the very first slave owners in America was actually black, Anthony Johnson. And it, when you read the history on it, the terminology used he came over as an indentured servant. He was an Af he was black, uh, listed as Af of African descent, was an indentured servant, fulfilled his, his time for indentured servitude, became a free man, became a landowner, and then acquired servants for life, which basically meant that they were slaves. They were that they were indicated separately as indentured servants which was indentured uh to was just for a limited amount of time but then they had servants that were servants for life these were slaves they you know that they were slaves that's all there was it's just the terminology was different now you talk to a bunch of uh people that dispute this and they'll say well they, they were servants for life they weren't really slaves it was just kind of an agreement that the that the people would stay there and act as servants in exchange for room and board and being taken care of. No. These people were slaves. So, anyway. Uh, but I find that interesting that percentage-wise, more Native Americans in the South owned slaves than whites. That's interesting. Regiments and possibly Jack Amos, or He Who Goes Out and Kills, was their most famous soldier in the Confederate armies. Stan Dwati led the Cherokee into battle against the Union, while John Jumper led the Seminole. But given the Seminole's stance on slavery, it shouldn't come as a surprise that many actually decided to aid the Union under Billy Bowlegs. And even the Cherokee were divided on the issue. Some under Jack Ross wanted to remain neutral aside with the Union, and there were some religious movements who wanted to go back to the traditional ways and abolish slavery, like the Kitu War Society. So again, opinions were divided during the war, which pitted native against native. At the end of the war, the United States needed to conclude separate treaties with the tribes in 1886, which means that they owned slaves for one year longer than the southern white plantation owners. As part of the treaties, many of the slaves were given citizenship to the tribe in which they were enslaved. But over the years, this was taken away from them. And as mentioned before, the fight to restore their citizenship took decades, over 140 years in fact, as it was only in 2017 that the US District Court ruled that these descendants should have citizenship rights in the Cherokee Nation. But there are similar fights ongoing with the other tribes, like the Choctaw. So the legacy of slavery in the Native American tribes continues today, but it is often... And a lot of the dispute over that is because the Indian tribes now, especially in Oklahoma, have the casinos. So they're trying to limit the number of people in their tribe that they have to divide that casino money up with. That's a big part of it, of why the, the Indian tribes are fighting these people from becoming uh, recognized tribal members in an overlooked aspect of history and this brings me to my question today do you know of any other forgotten slave trades a couple that come to my mind are the genoese galley slaves or the turkic raids into russia 
but if you know of any others, leave them in the comments below. All right, well, that was interesting. Glad we saw that. I learned a couple of new things. I think I remembered that the only 3% of whites in the South owned slaves at the start of the Civil War. I knew it was a low number, but I wasn't quite sure how low it was. I didn't remember. So that refreshed my memory. But the whole thing on 10% of the Native Americans owned slaves, that was, as far as I know, that was new knowledge for me. So... But anyway, I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did, found it as informative as I did. I hope you're all doing well, love you all, and remember, enjoy how bad it is today, because it will be worse tomorrow.